Conflict Transformation Online Summit that's exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm, my name is Ben Roberts. I'm one of the hosts of the gathering, and I've got the pleasure and honor of welcoming Starhawk to this interview. Starhawk is an author, an activist, permaculture designer, teacher, a prominent voice in modern earth-based spirituality and ecofeminism. She's the author or co-author of 13 books, including The Spiral Dance, A Rebirth of the Ancient Religion of the Great Goddess, and the ecotopian novel, The Fifth Sacred Thing, one that I particularly have enjoyed, and its sequel, City of Refuge. Uh, her most recent nonfiction book is The Empowerment Manual, a guide for collaborative groups on dynamics, power, conflict, and communications. And she is the founder of Earth Activist Training, where she teaches permaculture design grounded in spirituality with a focus on activism. She travels internationally, lecturing and teaching on Earth-based spirituality, the tools of ritual, and the skills of activism. So welcome to coming down to Earth, Starhawk. Such a delight to be with you now. Thank you, Ben. It's great to be with you, too. So given the importance of, of ritual in your work, we, we talked a bit about incorporating that into, um, into this exchange. And so I think you wanted to, to begin with, a, with an offering of that, of that type. Yeah, so I um, want to begin with acknowledging that I'm right now on uh, the land that is the traditional territory of the Kashaya Pomo. Um, and that they are still here. They haven't disappeared. Um, they haven't gone anywhere. Uh, that there's a history with this land of both incredible pain and suffering and exploitation, and also of incredible beauty and connection. Um, for me, it's important to acknowledge, you know, most of us are not living on the land of our ancestors. And we're guests on the land. And to be a good guest is to be respectful, uh, is to be grateful for the incredible privilege and opportunity of being able to be here in this beautiful place. Um, you know, as they say, guests and fish start to stink after three days. So. <laughs> If you're a guest that's sticking around for any length of time, it's helpful to pitch in and do the dishes and clean up after yourself. So again, being a guest here, I feel it's my responsibility to take up some of the work of tending and caring for the land. And I invite everyone to just take a moment now and honor the indigenous people of the land that you're on. Uh, if you don't know who they are, that's great. That's your homework to find out and learn something about them and to honor the work that has been done over generations and generations in so many different places and communities to tend the land, to care for it, um, to live in harmony with it. Blessed be. And we just take a deep breath and just for a moment, let's bring ourselves to where we are. So as you breathe in and out, become aware of your breath. Become aware of, of the pull of gravity on your body. Are your feet on the ground? Are you sitting? Are you standing? And you feel that connection to the earth. Could you imagine yourself like a tree with roots pushing down into the earth? And with a deep breath, imagine drawing some nourishment up, just as a tree draws up water and nutrients up through those roots, up through your feet and ankles, up through the base of your spine. And feeling your spine stretching and growing like a nice, beautiful, flexible tree trunk. Breathing some of that earth energy up into your heart. Take a moment feeling your heart open and expand, taking a deep breath and breathing it up and out through the top of your head, like branches that reach up to the sky and sweep back down and touch the earth again. And as you take a deep breath, feel those 
of the sunlight, or maybe where you are when you're watching this, it's moonlight, it's starlight, but feel that sky energy up there and feel how a tree feeds on sunlight. And take a breath and draw some of that energy down. Sun and moon and stars, that radiant energy that per pervades the universe. Down through the top of your head, down through your heart, your hands, your belly, and down into the earth. And just feel that energy flowing through you, up and out, and down into you, and feel yourself as a bridge between earth and sky. And blessed be, and welcome. Mm. Thank you. Welcome again to you. We've been starting these conversations out um, really with, with the stories of the various people who are informing our, our journey uh, into the, the realms of conflict and its transformational potential. And so what, what would you like to tell us about, about that journey for you? What was the call that you heard and, and how, have you, how have you followed it? Well, I would say I have lived a life um, that's been very much immersed in groups, um, small groups. Um, almost all of them have been groups that define themselves as non-hierarchical, as horizontal, uh, groups that didn't have a top-down structure. You know, um, I remember being in high school uh, in the time of the Vietnam War and being part of our high school students against the war in Vietnam group. It might be the first activist group I ever was part of. Uh, I think if you're an activist in high school, it gives you kind of a, a lifelong feeling of uh, excitement about activism, right? It's like, no matter what you're doing, it's that, oh, I'm getting out of the house. and. Uh, doing something with cool people. Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, I have been involved in spiritual groups uh, as part of the work of reviving some of the ancient goddess traditions of earth-based spirituality that come from Europe and from the Middle East. Um, feminist groups, because that spiritual journey for me was always very much part of a journey around women's liberation and the broader liberation of all people and sort of the disconnection of gender and power. Um, many, many different types of activist groups and uh, groups of friends, um, living situations. And so over decades, of being involved in groups like that, I began to realize that all of those groups seemed to have similar challenges that came up around power and conflict. You know, conflict is not something that we can avoid as human beings. I think we tend to see it as something from outside that comes in and messes things up instead of acknowledging that conflict is actually an inherent part of any human relationship. Because as human beings, we're not identical. And that's probably a good thing. We don't have identical goals. We don't have identical values. And so we have differences. And when those differences are pulling in different directions, that creates conflict. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, in fact, it's part of what keeps life interesting, it keeps groups alive and dynamic, um, what actually helps groups function in ways that are more intelligent. So I guess my personal journey kind of goes from, you know, being a, a student, a feminist, an anti-war activist in the 60s and um, being very involved in helping to 
start the feminist spirituality movement and the eco-feminist movement in the 70s and 80s, creating communities to do ritual together and to celebrate together and also to do activism together. Because for me, the spiritual and the political have never been separated. They're all about what are our deepest values and how do we take action in service of the things that are most deeply important to us. Um, and getting involved in the permaculture movement in the 80s and 90s. Um, because to me, that was sort of the practical side of believing that the earth is sacred. Um, and that also leads into other groups, teaching groups, organizing groups, creating nonprofits, creating classes, creating programs, those things. Um, and none of it has been free of conflict. So, <laughs> and uh, I wrote a book called The Empowerment Manual, A Guide for Collaborative Groups. It came out in 2011, just in time for the Occupy movement um, that sort of pulls together some of my experience and also some of my reading and understanding and some of the other research around collaborative groups and looking at the question, sort of looking at it from a lens of social permaculture. Uh, the idea if we think of permaculture as being the art of designing beneficial relationships, that was uh, Patrick Whitefield's definition. He was a wonderful permaculture teacher and designer from Great Britain. Um, so if you think about that, the way we approach designing a garden or a farm or a landscape um, can also be the way we approach designing a group and a structure. We're looking at what can we put in place that's going to further beneficial relationships and discourage non-beneficial relationships. Uh, and that to me is a fascinating field of study. It also feels very vital right now because I think it was Margaret Mead who said, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. Um, to change the world, we need effective groups that can work together. And if we can learn how to work together more effectively, that's going to empower absolutely everything that we do together as human beings. Yes, indeed. It, you know, I, I, permaculture, you're saying, you know, is, is a way for you that, that the, the sort of the spiritual and the sacred kind of came to ground as a practice. And, and it's also a metaphor, you know, to, for or a way to think about our relations, not just how we work literally with the soil. We're using the metaphor uh, of the soil in this in this journey, the coming down to earth journey. Um, and in the first week, we focus on, in some ways, how the the old uh, the dominant paradigms models of the soil have left it, you know, broken and lacking in in nourishment and, and tilth and all that. And now we're looking at how do we rebuild that? How do, what are practices that build the soil that nurture it? And and you know, social permaculture seems to be you know direct response to that need. And I'm curious if you have some stories, maybe particularly from your, your work in the context of permaculture or applying it in, in more relational settings, um, you know, a particular story of where that soil was effectively nurtured so that conflict was able, you know, was, was became a generative force in the group, the inevitability of that, the, the positive side of that as a reflection of the diversity that, you know, the biodiversity, ecodiversity that was present there. Um, really was allowed to to come forth in a in a situation. Is there some particular story that comes to mind, maybe that that might ground our conversation in, in your experience? Actually, the thing that's coming to mind right now um, when you were saying that was the moment I had this realization. It was um, when we were in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and there were a lot of groups that sprang up there. Um, to offer help um, at a time when the federal government was not being very functional, the Red Cross and the big organizations were not being very functional, 
and our group had come down there. We were working with a group called Common Ground Relief, which was started by a local resident, Malik Rahim, who'd been an old Black Panther back in the 60s, and put out a call for people to come down and help deter some of the white vigilante groups that were going around and, um, you know, sort of um, responding with incredible violence to the black community. And as part of that, we set up distribution sites, we set up um, a health clinic, and our group set up a little bioremediation project. Uh, trying to look at the soils and saying, well, what can we do to literally help heal the soil? And um, at one point we were working on a site where many years ago there had been an old dry cleaning establishment and we were doing a whole complicated technique of digging up all the soil, putting plastic under it, flooding it, putting plastic on top of it. So to treat it, to make it anaerobic for a few weeks and then to go back and take all the plastic out and treat it aerobically because that combination of anaerobic and aerobic is more effective in breaking down some of the toxins that are left from dry cleaning solvents. And I thought like, oh, it's like you look around here, you don't see any dry cleaning establishment or anything like it. You would never know that had happened, but it's still there in the soil kind of like in humans if we have a trauma you might not see it happening you might not know it's happening the residues are still there in our unconscious and healing the soil became very much part uh for me of actually doing work of trauma healing you know very very deeply connected to what we need to do sometimes to unearth those hidden traumas inside of us Common Ground Relief, I think, was both an example of some of the best and some of the worst in group dynamics and group process. The time that I was there, um, you know, what was exciting about it was having that non-hierarchical framework, having that framework of everyone can show up, everyone can bring what they want to bring, everyone is working together, uh, everybody is out of their comfort zone, you know, New Orleans was shattered. It was, you know, the city was completely destroyed. And because of that, all kinds of things were possible. Um, it's almost like today with the coronavirus in this moment, so many of the structures have been shattered that with all the trauma and pain, there's also openings that wouldn't exist. Um, you know, I remember one story, a friend of mine was working at the medical clinic uh, and told this story about a day that the garbage truck drove up to the medical clinic, stopped, the guy jumped out, went over to the massage table, got a massage, jumped back into the garbage truck. <laughs> and just thinking like, yes, this is the kind of world we want, a world where you know, if you're, you're the guy running the garbage truck, you can stop for a moment. Um, you know, people got things like massage and acupuncture who never would in their ordinary daily lives. And we were able to do incredible things together. Um, and I also saw the limits of that because um, as much as we were able to do the need was so huge and so enormous and so extensive. One day I found myself thinking like, well, we really need like a big overarching organization, something like the military that could go to every parish and make sure the needs are there and every town. And then I realized, oh, we are actually supposed to have something like that. Hmm. It's FEMA, right? <laughs> right? Why do we have government, right? And why we actually need effective government, you know, government is supposed to be a democratic government, the way we do self organize on a larger, larger scale, and, um, you know, a scale that will allow us to address problems that are just way, way, way too big for any of us to meet individually. Um, Common Ground Relief also 
you know, again, I remember one day when I was, we were sitting there in the backyard of Malik's home. Um, we were building a gray water system and a composting toilet. And I looked around and I realized I was sitting there with a nuclear engineer, an environmental engineer, and a professor of mathematics, all of us figuring out this gray water system. Um, luckily, at that moment, a plumber came along. <laughs> <laughs> I was married to a plumber for a number of years, so uh, I picked up a few things, you know, along the way. But, um, you know, but it was that ch chance to, again, step out of your area of expertise, you know, to grapple with problems and work together collaboratively. And that part of it was beautiful. Um, Common Ground Relief also had some enormous conflicts um, when it turned out later, you know, in the following year or so, that it was actually infiltrated by someone who was actually working for the FBI. But, you know, that was another situation. Um, but yeah, I would say that there have been so many experiences in my life where that feeling when you are working together with a group of people and you are connected, you're working toward a common goal. You're enjoying the work and you're enjoying each other and you're learning and you're interacting. To me, that's one of the best feelings in the world. And I think we crave that. When we talk about community, you know, we crave that sense of connectedness and effectiveness, effectiveness together in ways that go beyond what we can do alone by ourselves. Yeah, you know, you're naming that that disaster can be one of the mm -hmm. you know, the underlying conditions where where that's brought out in us, where we're you know our our best selves are called forward. Um, mm -hmm. We're certainly seeing lots of examples of that with the mutual aid work that's being done now in response to the virus. And, um, you know, Rebecca Solnit wrote that wonderful book, A Paradise Built in Hell, sort of cataloging how this this is. This is the natural response for the vast majority of us, and and I wonder, you know, at the same time, you, you know, you're naming that the challenge was to see how how huge the amount of work was to be done in the wake of Katrina, um, and similarly now, whether it's responding to the virus or just seeing, you know, looking at climate change and saying, wow, you know, here's the whole world kind of sort of collaborating on this thing, you know. Why can't we seem to do it better for you know this truly existential threat and and the scale of that and saying, you know this is what government's for, really it's and it's supposed to be doing that and taking that role, and it's not um, uh, and it seems to me that there's that in that in in grappling with that right that that we we can get into these situations where the best of us is called forth, but we can only sustain that for so long before we have to deal with this larger context of, wow, you know, are we making, as, as Bob Stilger said in one of the other interviews for the series, are we making enough of a difference to make a difference? Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, you know, what, how do we fertilize soil, you know, when that's the, if that's the context, if we're looking at the scale of what we're doing and saying, wow, it seems like maybe we're just planting this tiny garden in the middle of, you know, massive desertification and and you know if there were a million of us all doing the same thing you know that's what we need but it seems to be just a few hundred of us um do you have any you know is there is there a way that that you know that that to reframe that perhaps that that allows us to continue sourcing positive energy and i think it's, i think a source of conflict too right is that larger context is the the pain the, the yeah. collective trauma of being in that larger context and how do we metabolize that? How do we, if we have to do the, some version of your treatment of the soil with the anaerobic and the aerobic something to, to, to take that trauma and, and, um, and detoxify uh, hmm. ourselves from it. I don't know. Yeah. I think that, um, we need to figure out not just how do we create these beautiful little, 
communities and villages and stuff for ourselves, but how do we then scale that up? And you can scale that up by creating bigger and bigger systems, or you can scale that up by creating multiple smaller systems and networks and links and connections between them. Um, so what we're really talking about is movement building. How do we build movements that, have, that are movements for caring and compassion and nurturing and responsibility and taking care of the earth and taking care of one another, you know, for justice, for ecological balance. Um, and I think sometimes we're very good at that and sometimes we're not so good at that. And often we're not so good at that when we deal with conflict within our movements and within the people who might want to be part of our movement, when we deal with that in toxic ways. Um, you know, I wrote a piece some time ago, I think it was after Trump got elected, talking about building a welcoming movement and how this is an opportunity to bring in people who have never been active before and bring them into the movement. And to do that, we need to think about how do we actually welcome people in? Right? Um, and especially in a climate where so much activism takes place online and there's this almost this algorithm, this push to exclude people, to define yourself by who you unfriend. And, um, you know, there's often uh, a focus on policing our language. Um, I'm thinking also of the, the challenge with the, um, the women's march around women who wanted, you know, who were not aligned with the, um, the pro-choice movement, but wanted to participate. And right. that, or I think there may have been a similar conflict around Israel and so these are sort of touch points with, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know, we have a choice of kind of requiring ideological purity and saying, I really only want to work with people that fully agree with me on all the important things, or does it make sense to have a broader 10 and say, we can find common ground to work on X and Y, even if we're actually on opposite sides of, of Z. Mm -hmm. and, you know, do you have thoughts on that? It seems like it fits somehow with the diversity piece that you were naming before around, you know, conflict that, and, and if we drill down far enough with any two of any of us, we're going to probably find some point where if we have strongly held beliefs about anything, we're going to be on different sides of something. Uh, at least that seems to be my experience more and more. Well, again, yeah, because we're not identical. And even if we may share many common values, we might not share every single value. You know, we might have major agreement on, you know, a million different things and you might be a vegan and I might be a meat eater, you know. <laughs> it's another big fault line that's showing up now. Um, so sometimes it's about knowing where we can collaborate and where we need to hold our boundaries. You know, um, if you're the vegan and I'm the meat eater, we can definitely collaborate on, um, you know, supporting people's right to vote. And We're opposing industrial agriculture, right? Opposing industrial agriculture, <laughs> rebuilding healthy soil, exactly. on many, many things we might not want to live in the same collective household and try to share meals together, okay? Or at least uh, if we do, we're gonna acknowledge that we have these differences and we're maybe not gonna share every meal together. Or maybe if I go in and cook my meat, you're gonna agree not to cry. <laughs> Well, and where it gets even more challenging is that, you know, it may, these aren't just lifestyle choices often, they're theories of change around, you know, what moves us towards the world that we want, and, and if you... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people may, you know, people have really strong feelings about it. We don't know either, right? We have strong opinions and feelings, but there's also this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you are, if your feelings about not eating meat are so strong that you really are going to cry if somebody does, then it's better, again, to sort of set that as one of your core principles in your living situation. 
and say, okay, I don't want to live with people who are going to cook meat. Uh, I might work with them, I might be in coalition with them on a lot of other things, but my living space is too close in. You know, I need a different level of comfort and um, I don't want to have to be fighting this battle or confronted with this every single time I go into the kitchen. I like to think of activism as an ecosystem and to recognize, you know, if we can recognize that different groups and different people have different niches and different functions and that not everybody has the same function. And our goal should not be able, should not be to make everybody adopt our tactics, but rather to understand how those different functions can work together and support each other. You know, so maybe I'm like the direct action gal. I'm like, you know, let's just go out and feed the hungry. Even if the laws say you can't do it, we're going to go down in front of city hall and we're going to serve food and we're going to embarrass the hell out of government because um, they haven't dealt with the homeless crisis. They haven't dealt with the hunger crisis here and we're just going to do it. Um, like, Keith McHenry did when they started Food Not Bombs many, many years ago. You, know, you can feed the hungry at a church or a soup kitchen. It can be a really good thing to do, but it's not necessarily a direct action. You go do it in front of City Hall, embarrass the mayor, get arrested for feeding the homeless, <laughs> making issue out of it. It becomes an action. That might be one niche. It's a very powerful one to fill. But maybe you're the guy that believes in being part of the city government and working within the agencies and trying to work on the homeless thing from within, you know, and um, instead of denouncing you as a soulless bureaucrat, I might do better to say, how can we make an alliance? You know, how can our direct action help support you in getting through the policies that you want? Um, how can you help support us you know, in actually getting food out to people and actually shifting this position? And when we do that, when we've done that, you know, I remember um, many years ago in 2003, the World Trade Organization met in Cancun. Mm -hmm. And there were groups of activists who went down there to protest it because uh, these global trade deals were profoundly undemocratic. You know, they were overriding laws that we made, you know, safety laws, environmental laws, uh, labor laws, uh, and allowing corporations to roam around the globe with to find the fewest restrictions and the best return their investment while people were not allowed to move to the places where they could most easily make a living. So there were thousands of campesinos who came from all over Latin America. And there were international students and activists who came there. There were Mexican students uh, who came there. And we did some powerful direct actions. Um, and we built installations to help in the encampment that showed off our permaculture. Uh, and we did some, I think, really great work from outside the system to bring light on these injustices. Uh, and at the same time, we had allies who were in the meetings, who were in NGOs that were part of the meetings. Uh, there were even a few sympathetic delegates, especially from the global south. And it was the combination of the two. Um, you know, at one point we had this day of action, the, the meetings were like eight miles down on this peninsula in Cancun, like Cancun City is on the mainland, but the area with all the hotels and the convention center is kind of on an island. And to get there, there were military blockades and barricades and everything else. You couldn't just hike through the back country because it was ocean on one side and a lagoon full of raw sewage and alligators on the other side. <laughs> um, so we'd mostly been doing things at the barricade, but we had one day where all, 
everyone dressed up as tourists and the students and the internationals kind of infiltrated throughout the day, got out to the shopping mall that was next to the convention center. And at a prearranged time, we just all swarmed out and blocked the road just as the delegates were going to dinner. And it was really an amazing, uh, we had a beautiful blockade. Our group led a spiral dance. Uh, some of our friends had managed somehow or other to get in and get through all the police blockades carrying trees and pots that we could put in the center and dance around to represent the world we wanted to create. And, um, and when it was over, we were, we thought we might all get arrested, but actually they just put us on buses and brought us back. Um, but that kind of, at one point when we were dancing in the spiral, one of the delegates came and joined us. And he said to one of our guys in Spanish, you know, he said like, yeah, he said, what's going on inside there? That's all bullshit. I'm going to stay out here and join the dance. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, what happened was the talks fell apart. And that was partly because the folks from the global south walked out. And part of the reason they walked out was they could see right at their doorstep, there was this amazing opposition from ordinary people from all over the world what was going on there so they felt that they had the support to be able to take that strong stand and that again is the kind of thing that can happen when um, again when we see it as an ecosystem I think another one of the negative patterns I see it's kind of what I think of as the ladder of oppression mm. you, know, you can imagine all you're on a ladder and you know, above you, you're trying to climb up this ladder and above you, there are all kinds of people who are higher up the ladder than you are. And you can't get past them. They're blocking your way. And below you, there are other people that are below you on the ladder. They can't get even up to where you are. And if you're not careful, you know, they might grab you and pull you down. So you're trying to get up this ladder and you can't see the person who's at the top of the ladder. You can't see who created this ladder, who put you on it in the first place. What you see is the big behind of the person who's just immediately one rung up above you. And it's really easy to direct all your anger and all your hostility at that person who's one rung above because that's the ass in your face. Uh -huh. And much harder to pull back and get a picture of the ladder as a whole. And it's easy also to like kick out and try to stomp on the fingers of the person below you um, because you don't want them to claw you down that ladder. Um, but I think that we're seeing a lot of that now. Uh, I read an interesting book called The Politics of Resentment. I can't remember the name of the author, but I can find it for you. Um, that was all, she was a sociologist who went around interviewing people in Wisconsin uh, during the time when Scott Walker um, was basically trying to undermine the labor rights of all the public employees and talking to people in rural Wisconsin. And what she found was there was this tremendous resentment among a lot of people against public employees because they saw them as being better off, you know, they had pensions when the private sector had gotten rid of them, for example. Why, why should they get to retire if I can't? Right? Yeah. Why should they have health care when I don't? You uh, know? As opposed to, can't we all have those things? <laughs> yeah, and I really saw that as an example of that latter phenomenon. You know, you live in a small town, your business is failing because the small towns all over America are failing. And that really goes back to our agricultural policy, our soil policies. Um, the way we approach agriculture, the, what we subsidize and what we don't subsidize, all of those huge forces 
but what you see is like your kid's school teacher gets to go off on a three month vacation every year while you never get a day off and you're having to work an extra job just to keep from losing your farm. Uh, so I think we need to point out that phenomenon. And again, we need to be better at supporting people rather than just blaming people and finding ways again to help people see that bigger picture and also to help people organize around it so that we can all meet our needs. And uh, we aren't seeing school teachers as, you know, the arch enemy, right? Uh, we're understanding that um, we all need to come together and work together to create systems that can actually provide for all of us. And we're seeing the reverse of it now. I think after all, after this resentment surfaced, mm -hmm. it became such a political force. Now we're seeing that resentment, you know, towards those people who have, you know, been on the, the losing end of all of this, um, mm -hmm. you know, so, so dramatically and, and their expression of resentment is itself now seen, well, it's causing great harm. You could certainly argue. Um, and I think it's a challenge to our movements to, um, you know, as you say, to, to, to be welcoming, to be inclusive, to not replicate that pattern of resentment. We're not going to build the world we want using the same patterns that are, are creating the, the dysfunctional systems we have now just by, you know, somehow doing that more effectively, but, but with the same tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things that can be helpful to us, um, is to understand that conflict is not always good versus evil. Um, many times within our movements, our conflicts are um, good versus good. You know, they're, they're about values that we might both support, um, but which one we're giving heavier weight to at the moment. You know? um, and can we can we hold those as a generative tension? Yeah. As opposed to an either or choice. Yeah, maybe I have a value of really wanting our courses to be accessible to people who don't have a lot of money, um, wanting them to be available to anyone who wants them. And maybe I also have a value of wanting to pay people for their work and not be exploiting the people who are running the system and doing the system. And those aren't always easy values to hold together. Um, but, you know, if I acknowledge them and say, okay, you know, like, uh, if you want to get paid, that doesn't make you evil. Uh, if you want me to get paid, that really doesn't make you evil, right? You know, if I I yearn, I yearn for a, a, a concept other than getting paid, right, or earning a living, like like we, we weren't all just given life. You know? <laughs> I'm yeah. searching for alternative language there. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we understand, okay, it's not easy to solve this problem. It's not easy to help people have a sustainable livelihood in a world that's really not all that set up to reward the work of helping and nurturing. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you know, it's not that easy to make things available to people, um, you know, in a world where everything's about money and the value of money. Right. And then we can start coming up with creative solutions. And there are many, many different ways we might approach this. Um, but we can feel like we're on the same team and we're working together and that our differing weights on those different values actually help strengthen both of us, you know, help us come up with something that's going to meet a broader range of needs than if either one of us like won and triumphed. I think it's also really helpful when we think about conflict 
again, to get into the practice of encouraging people to disagree really strongly about ideas, about principles, about values, um, but not to turn that into devaluing each other as a person, not to turn it into personal attacks. And that's not always easy to do, but when we can do that, you know, then I think we actually have more interesting, exciting groups because um, it's got all that life, you know, from people bringing in their strongest visions. And I can support you and affirm you, even if I disagree with you on, you know, I'm probably over a lifetime you know, we're going to disagree on a lot of things, but I can still support your creativity. And if I think your idea is wacky, I can support the wildness of your imagination. And um, again, to do that, we have to, again, separate that judgment. You know, we live, we come out of a culture that basically undermines the self-worth of every single one of us. Um, because it says you have no inherent worth. You know, you have to prove your worth by working hard, by achieving, by making money, by um, accepting Jesus, whatever it is. But, you know, if we lived in a world that said, like, you are a precious being just for being you. Um, you have incredible gifts and talents that you're here to share. Um, but the but your value isn't that you're gifted and talented. Your value is that you're a human being. Your value is that you're a human being who strives to make choices that are a benefit to other human beings, to the world around us, to the whole community of beings that we're part of. Then I'm, again, then it's easier for me to disagree with you without devaluing you and to welcome you, even if, you know, in the vast Venn diagrams of what we all believe in, you know, they're not 100% overlapping. There are areas of difference. And understand in nature, diversity brings resilience. So if we have those areas of difference, that's part of bringing more resilience into our system. thinking back again to your story about um, the recovery from Katrina and the point where your group, as much as you were finding this satisfaction and joy in working together um, creatively to, to address this great need, realized that the need was so far beyond what you could do and that, you know, FEMA was supposed to be doing this and was failing. And, that, you know, we, you know, you were having to step in because of these larger conditions that were so broken down. And it seems to me that, that, you know, there are lots of versions of that kind of realization happening across our movements where the, you know, the, 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 the soil has been so depleted and abused by these systems of extraction and oppression that have run for so long, despite our best efforts to, to change them, to resist them, to dismantle them. And, and so, it's created this enormous pressure, this sense of urgency, this sense that we have less and less time and that, you know, whatever the, whatever I believe the right answer is, we've got, everyone's got to follow that. And we don't have room for too much diversity of approaches. We don't have time. And, and, you know, so that I think a lot of conflict within our movements is coming out of that, that larger context. And I'm curious if you have more you want to say about how to work generatively in that space and that perhaps there's something from your work with indigenous peoples and your learnings about, you know, indigenous traditions, whether it's the, the, the goddess based work or, or others um, that might provide some guidance there. Yeah, I think that we are living in a traumatic time and we're, we're constantly you know, what trauma is, is this combination of threat and helplessness. 
and um, there are many sorts of trauma. You know, there's the trauma that happens to you when you're the one getting hit. There's another level of trauma when you're seeing someone get hit, and especially traumatic if you can't do anything about it. There's another level of trauma when you're reading or hearing about someone getting hit. And there's another level of trauma when you're the one doing the hitting. Um, and all of those kinds of traumas are so active and we carry with us the heritage of so much historical trauma. Um, you know, from the past, you know, indigenous communities carry this incredible weight of trauma. I think now that we're here in the midst of this pandemic, you know, and every day the death toll gets higher and higher, maybe it can give us just a little, a little more ability to sort of imagine and empathize with the experience of the people, of the nations of this land who often saw 75%, 90% of their people die from diseases, from outright being hunted, from incredible kinds of oppression and the level of trauma that that represents. But I think activism requires a great ability to do trauma healing. And one of the ways you work with people who've been traumatized is by supporting their agency, supporting their ability to make choices for themselves. Even if those choices are not necessarily the choices you think they should be making. Um, I did some trauma support in Palestine. Uh, I was there with the International Solidarity Movement that supports nonviolent resistance against the occupation. Uh, I was there after Rachel Corey was killed, who was a young woman from Washington State uh, who was trying to defend a Palestinian home from being bulldozed by Israeli soldiers and the soldiers ran over her with the bulldozer. Um, so I supported the team who'd been with her. A few couple weeks later, another activist in Gaza, the same team uh, named Tom Herndl was shot by an Israeli sniper. I went down to support them and I saw like, again, both some of the best and some of the worst, you know, some of the best were people who would just show up and say, what do you need? You know, maybe looking around here, it's like, maybe they just need someone to cook a meal or to clean the house. Um, and the worst were the people who were like, tell me about your trauma because you know, you must, you know, share it. And it wasn't really about them. It was about that person's need to feel like I am the healer. Uh, so if we think about supporting that trauma on the bigger scale, like we have to start by asking ourselves, what do people really need to feel a sense of agency? And sometimes what people need is a space you know, uh, I came up in the women's movement. And I remember that era in the 70s and the 80s when we wanted women's spaces. And every time we'd have a, say, this is going to be a women's space, there'd be one man who'd show up and say, well, I'm here because I want to support you and I want to learn from you. And oftentimes, like, the whole the whole meeting would devolve into arguments about whether or not to let this one man be there. But that's not supportive. Right? Supportive would be to say, okay, I need to stay out of this space, actually, and understand that I don't have um, the right, you know, I don't have um, the entitlement to be in every single space in the world. Um, sometimes people need separation in order for healing. And if I really want to support them, I can support them by not intruding on that time and space and taking it up with my need, but actually stepping back and letting their needs be prominent. Um, 
when we think about how do we show up as allies for communities that might not be our personal community, if we're working with indigenous folks, or if we're working with people of color and we happen to be white, or we're working with people who are gender diverse and we are cisgendered, whatever it is, you know, is, I like to think about, uh, I call it the Lord of the Rings metaphor. You know, I'm a novelist as well. I think a lot in terms of stories. In stories, there's always a protagonist. And the protagonist is the one who sort of carries the central thread of the story. Not always the most powerful person. Um, in Lord of the Rings, it's Frodo. It's this little hobbit who in most ways is kind of just ordinary, you know, but he's the one who's carrying the ring. He's not the most powerful person in the story. You know, he's not Gandalf, the great wizard. He's not like, you know, Aragorn, the secret king of the whole place. Right? You know, he's not like Boromir, the great warrior. He's just a little guy, but he's the one carrying the ring. When we show up to be allies, we have to ask who's actually carrying the ring here? You know, if I'm coming into your community, I'm not the one carrying the ring. And I might have to step back and say, okay, my role here is to be in support of your goals and your vision, because you're the one carrying the ring here. It doesn't make me powerless. It doesn't make me devalued. You know, Gandalf is an incredibly powerful wizard, but his role is to support Legolas, this magical elf. You know, maybe I'm Legolas. <laughs> right. um, but still, my role is to support and knowing who, whose story it is. We all get to be the protagonists of our own story. To me, that was one of the great realizations of the feminist movement is as a woman you're sort of you know certainly a woman of my generation you're kind of raised and conditioned to be the support for you know to find the guy and support their story and not to be the protagonist of your own story and it was incredibly liberating to say oh right like I get to carry my own ring right? and I get to ask for support from other people when it is my story but if I'm going into somebody else's story, you know, then I have to be willing to sort of step back and let them be the one to carry the ring. To me, all of that, we were talking about preparing the soil. Mm -hmm. When I think about the soil of groups, I think about the framework that we set, the deep underlying assumptions and understandings that we have about who we are and how we want to work together. Um, if we come from a framework that says everybody has inherent value, that creates a very different world than if we come from a framework that says some people are the valuable people and other people are kind of like the filler. If we come from a framework that says our role as human beings is to be part of nature, and to be nature's healing hands and observing eyes um, and to work in harmony with her. That's a very different framework than if we say our role is to dominate nature or if we say like a lot of environmental groups do, we're a blight on the natural world and she'd be better off without us. I mean, you can certainly see the case for that, but it's not an effective way to mobilize people, right? And I've it's been not the history right? of the planet either for the time that humanity's been here, where we, we mm -hmm. you know, indigenous people were incredible stewards and still are. Of yeah. Their lands, right? It, and, you know, the, the Amazon and the, the, the jungles of the, the Mayans in Central America were food forests. Yeah. And indigenous people also made incredible mistakes. You know, and, uh, you know, animals went extinct and, you know, the 
great flightless birds of New Zealand were hunted to extinction. Um, but again, indigenous cultures are not set in stone. So they're not fossils. They're living and evolving, and they always have been. Um, and many of them learned from those mistakes. And we can too. Well, we've made tremendous mistakes, but we've also created incredible possibilities and gifts. You know, we're talking now over this amazing technology that's allowing us to stay connected in spite of this pandemic, you know. And, um, you know, so our goal now, I think, should be, again, our framework should not be, you know, let's all flagellate ourselves about how bad and awful humans are, but let's put our incredible creativity to work, you know, to learn from the natural world, to be humble in relationship, as indigenous elders often tell us, you know, uh, to give back and to use that capacity to create the kinds of balance that we actually need right now to do the work of healing. And I completely believe that we're capable of doing that. I believe you're right, Starhawk. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that message of possibility and healing and, and um, the connection of our ancient and, and modern wisdom.